Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, it's my pleasure to introduce Nahum Dershowitz. He is best known for his work on rewrite theory and uh, termination theory. He's the rewrite man, as some people say. But there is another angle of it. He's less known in, in this community. He co-authored a definitive book on calendars. And at the end of this lecture, you will be not able to buy it on this table. It's not a, <laughs> not a commercial enterprise. <laughs> but maybe you can order it through Amazon or Barnes & Noble, so whatever. Welcome now. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about my hobby and my passion, and, uh, which is calendars. No. So we, we all use calendars uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, we get these uh, computer tools for calendars, and we know when it's Father's Day in case your kids forget, and so on. And there are various tools to uh, help you uh, uh, interface the computer to input dates and, and, and the like. But in fact, uh, one of the original meanings of computer is someone who would calculate calendars in particular. You can see from the OED, a computer is a person who calculates, not a machine that calculates. And in particular, the calendars of these computers, and that's how I got into computer science, obviously. <laughs> now, this is a very respectable academic field, calendars, and I found this paper recently from 84, which had a whole long paper, because the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature insists that the dates you write in, the, in your papers are on the Gregorian calendar, but you may have to translate something from the Julian or the French Revolutionary, so you read this paper and you find out how to do it right. And, and um, not only random papers like that, but even very uh, respected people like Newton spent much, many, too many years of his life worrying about chronology and dates and so on, so I'm in good company. And uh, not only is it a question of dates, but you also have to worry about holidays. Like here's a sample uh, three-month period from 94 in which you can see over here Chinese New Year, Ramadan, Ash Wednesday, the equinox, Passover, Easter, various dates that are easy to calculate. Valentine's Day every year is on the same date. But Ramadan moves through the year and Chinese New Year, you can never know when it is unless uh, someone tells you Passover, Easter and the like. One needs to know dates. So my passion is not just, is not to collect calendars, or, 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 but it's to uh, understand calendars and to program them. And to do it correctly, to do it completely, and in fact to, to do it uh, as aesthetically as I can. So there, there are books out there, very many libraries in this country have this book by Paris, so every time you call a librarian, ask, you know, I have this document, what, what date is it on, uh, on the ordinary calendar? She goes, looks it up, comes back to you on the telephone with the answer. Unfortunately, this book is chock full of errors. In particular, Easter in 1582 wasn't on Sunday. There are also Unix calendar programs that give you Easter on Monday and Tuesday in the future. You need to be careful. Al Biruni is a fellow who in the year 1000 wrote a monumental book about the calendars of the world and many, many other books. And he also wrote about India. But the footnotes there give you all kinds of transcriptions of dates that, that are way off. And I just recently read an article in which it had a footnote like this, that according to Mahler, 18th of January corresponds to this day. In the Hebrew calendar, there was some earthquake in, in Israel uh, uh, in many uh, centuries ago. But according to another calculation, it's the next day. I mean, which one is it? Uh, he should have he been able to find out. Well, uh, one would hope to have some definitive sources for such things. But unfortunately, uh, it's not so simple. And, and I'll, bring you, I'll show you some examples uh, of uh, problems. So, so I don't know, any of you had this Pontiac for, 
uh, from 2004, according to the newspaper, it didn't know which day of the week was what in 2005 because 2004 was a leap year and that wasn't taken into account. Okay, that's just a car company. Lotus and Excel, and in fact all spreadsheets don't know the rules for, for leap years either, which uh, in particular they get 1900 wrong. I'll tell you a little bit more about that if you like, but they used to get 2000 wrong. That mistake was fixed, you know, in VisiCalc or wherever, but uh, 1900 is still wrong. I once had uh, this company, Delvina, it's no longer in business, but uh, they had a calendar on my Macintosh uh, and the dates were all wrong, the holidays were wrong. It was uh, very disconcerting. Well. I got to the University of Illinois and they printed a calendar, I think it was for 79, and you know, what day is Yom Kippur? They had, they had last year's date, you know. They, they repeated the, the, the same thing this year as last year, which it wasn't. Well, I got to Tel Aviv University, you think they at least do know when. <laughs> no way. <laughs> completely, completely wrong. Well, to get a little closer to home, Windows NT doesn't know when daylight savings time is. I'm not talking about the change this year, I'm talking about the rule that's been, been around for decades. They also didn't get, um, Outlook doesn't know, didn't know when Memorial Day was or Thanksgiving, so come 2000 they fixed uh, one problem but introduced others. A and uh, th these kind of problems, okay, so when you get a calendar, say there was one from uh, Jackson Madison County Hospital that has the wrong date of Thanksgiving, I, I don't know if that it was Outlook's fault or, or somebody else's fault, it's embarrassing to say the least. In that case, uh, everyone came to the picnic on the wrong day. That was a problem. Well, you'd think at least the U.S. Naval Observatory, what, what greater authority is there in matters astronomical? They got the dates of Passover. In the future, albeit all wrong. Okay, so there's work to do. Well, that's, that, that's one point, to get it right. I also want to have it complete. So, so many uh, calendars out there, particular computerized calendars, have tables. Someone gives them a table and based on the table they fill in dates. So that's fine, but that's very limited. I'm interested not in just a table for one year or for 50 years, but something that will work forever and ever. And uh, so I tried to get Chinese holidays from Google for 2007. You know, it's supposed to be Chinese New Year here. Nothing, because there was only 2006 on this calendar. No one bothered with 2007. But finally, I'd like the programs to be pretty. <laughs> Now, I tried this out, it didn't work on, uh, on one Unix, but I presume it works on some other Unix, but anyway, that, I don't know what it means, but it's supposed to compute Easter for you. Okay, so my, my passion for calendars began when I got a telescope for a present, uh, once upon a time, and this uh, years later led to this book, Calendrical Calculations, with my co-author Ed Rheingold, who dragged me into this, never mind under what uh, duress, but uh, the book is going to third edition now, and that's why uh, you can't sign the copies. You have to wait till, till September, October when it comes out. Don't buy the second edition. Wait for the third. <laughs> okay. So today, I, as far as I know, is the 14th of June. Fine. But, uh, okay, we, we have an applet. You see it's not just the 14th of June. It's also the 1st of June. It also has a date on the Islamic calendar, the Persian calendar, the our Armenian calendar, Ethiopia, Coptic, you know, there are lots of calendars out there. And this is just a small sample of the calendars that most of these are still in use someplace in the world and, and make a difference, particularly make a difference if you're trying to schedule something and don't want to interfere with the holiday. So I'm going to talk to you just about a small sampling of, holiday, of calendars and very, very little about holidays, if at all. I'll tell you something about the Gregorian calendar. That today is universal. Everyone in the world has a Gregorian calendar. There are some countries in which the year number is different, but other than other than that, it's universal. But there's the ancient Mayan calendar, there's the Julian Old Style calendar, Hebrew calendar, Easter, the Islamic calendar, Hindu calendar, Chinese and Martian calendar, don't forget the last one. I'd like to tell you something about them over the next hour. So I tried to break down calendars that come really into three major groups. Uh, the solar calendars are calendars that depend on the sun, the year is the, base, uh, the basic ingredient, the Gregorian calendar is an example of that. It follows what's called the tropical year. That's the seasonal year. But the Hindu calendar, one of the Hindu calendars is also a solar calendar, but it follows the, the position of the sun and the stars, not the seasons, which is something altogether different. There are lunar calendars and purely lunar, lunar solar. I'll talk about all of them. And diurnal, one in which calendars that just count the days, which is really easy. So if, look at the calendars I want to tell you about. Solar calendars include the Gregorian, one of the Mayan calendars, Julian calendar, Hindu calendar, 
one of the Hindu calendars are solar based, these, these are based on the sun. We'll also talk about lunar calendar, in particular the Islamic calendar, which, which has uh, every month begins with a new moon, and, and that's it. Then there are the more complicated calendars that try to both follow the sun and the moon, lunar solar calendars, in particular the Hebrew calendar, the calculation of Easter, a fascinating Hindu calendar, and the Chinese calendar are examples of lunar solar calendars. And, and di uh, calendars that just count uh, the days are pretty boring, but we'll talk about them. And uh, time permitting, uh, whether or not there's time left, I'll tell you about Mars. And if you read the book, there are many more calendars, which I won't talk about. So, uh, and many more that we haven't uh, gotten around to worrying about yet. But what happens is people come to us and say, why, what about my favorite calendar? Like Stolman from Emacs said, you know, where's the French Revolutionary calendar? That's really important, I don't know why. Well, so first thing we have to do is go to the library and dust off these old tomes and, and try to understand how the calendar works. That's not always possible. There, there are calendars for which uh, the, nothing's written. Then, then things get hard. After you've done that, we try to unravel the really the inner workings of the calendar, not how it's presented, because it's often presented after people try to uh, incorporate shortcuts and uh, you know people don't want to multiply, so they have log tables sometimes. People don't want negative numbers, don't want big fractions. There are all kinds of uh, things in the books that, that are, are no longer relevant in the computer age. We did our programming in Lisp, being that it's such a beautiful language, as you can see, but it had many advantages for us. And finally, to check it. So we get all our family members to go through these tables, these books which have, you can find books with like Chinese dates corresponding to Gregorian dates, but uh, then you find uh, inconsistency. Whose fault is it? You know, often it's not. It's a typo in the book. And so all our secretaries and family members uh, helped us in that regard. Just a few words about, about doing the research, why it's problematic. You take something like the Mayan calendar, they have lots of books. They're in, even in English. You can read the books. The only problem is that the experts disagree. Well, so you choose. Okay, that's not hard to choose. Come to, come to the Persian calendar. Well, it turns out there's one person in Tehran who's in charge of the calendar, Birashk. And, uh, well, he has his own ideas, which is not exactly what it says in the law books of, of Iran. Well, again, you have to make a choice. Do you listen to him or do you listen to the law books or do you program both, which is what we did. And, and then this, someone sends me an email, oh, I'm in Israel, I should be able to do the Samaritan calendar, That's, I can find. So I found the expert, Mr. Cohn, and uh, unfortunately he tells me, he himself gives me two methods that are contradictory. Now, how he decides which, of, which one to follow, I have yet to find out, so I can't do that one yet. China, well, there was simply nothing in a Western language that was complete and accurate until we wrote this book, published that is. And, okay, so what do we do? Well, lots of, lots of tables. Finally, well, the, the expert on the Chinese calendar sits in the Purple Mountain Observatory, but no fax machine, at least when we were writing the book. How do we, how do we check if we've succeeded in reverse engineering the Chinese calendar? Well, we had an old student who, who was living in, in uh, Beijing, and he, we, he did have access to a fax machine, fax him a letter, he carried it over to the observatory. And, and so, okay, so we did that. The Hindu calendar, well, that you can find almost everything uh, explained very clearly in English, but when it comes to the Hindu ho holidays, I have no way of uh, finding out the details, and no one wants to tell me either, because the, they print calendars in, in the temple and they make money from it. Tibet, similar, I wrote, I wrote to the you know, the person, I don't know what his name was, who was in charge of the calendar in Tibet, but he didn't bother answering. Finally, he found someone who somehow knew how it works and we recently programmed it, one of the Tibetan calendars. As for Nepal, that's a state secret. I, I got, <laughs> no, this is serious, I got, I got someone from an NGO in Nepal wanted us to program the calendar because um, sometimes m m the trafficking in women, some people write a, a date in the Nepalese calendar, other people write a date in the Gregorian calendar. They want to see is this the same person, the same date, same incident. No way of knowing. Well, that, that's still a mystery. All right. Um, so I've promised in the abstract to answer these 10 questions. And so uh, how many days there were in 1752? That's an easy one. Is there a year zero? Was there February 30th? 
how do you lose a million dollars? Uh, we already know the answer to who thinks 1900 is a leap year. Why is Passover late often? Why is Ramadan early? Uh, and so on. And I uh, don't promise to answer them, but I hope to answer them all. So let's uh, get into this. Back a little history. Well, this is one of the oldest calendars discovered. You know, it's like a pegboard. You can stick these pegs in here. At least they think it's a calendar. They think it's a calendar. Well, there are 12 holes here. That sounds like 12 months. There are 30 days. That sounds like uh, the length of a month. But no one knows what those three on top are for. Are they for decoration, for hanging it on your wall? I think maybe it has to do with the leap year structure, but that's just a wild guess. So, but, but you already see here that the, you can count days by putting a, a, something, a peg in the hole. You can count months, then when, this, when you get to the end of that, you, can, you, you move on to the next month. So this has been around for thousands of years. The problem, all calendars are an attempt to put three things together, or, or two or three things together that just don't fit. You have the day. Well, the day is 24 hours, but uh, it's not exactly 24 hours, well, unless you define it to be 24 hours. It's, it's not the same length. Days get longer and shorter. Not only do they get longer and shorter over the year in sort of a regular pattern, but they get longer and shorter in, in arbitrary patterns that we don't really understand. In fact, the, the length of the day has been affected by this big dam that they built in China that changes the way the earth wobbles. You know, and, and so there's something that astronomers call delta t. This is, a cur this is why you have leap seconds, because you have to get, uh, keep your uh, day uh, in sync with the clock. Well, the moon, uh, the month, a synodic month is approximately 29 and a half days, but not exactly. And not only that, it's a moving target because every year it gets a little shorter. And similarly, uh, the, the length of the year changes. So even if you do come up with some scheme for the calendar, it won't last very long because the, the, everything's going to change on you. So let me talk first about the solar calendars that, that we use uh, regularly. These are calendars intended to keep uh, in tune with the seasons. Now in equatorial regions, they're not so popular because there are no seasons, but much of the rest of the world has a solar calendar. So when, uh, okay, this, this is uh, already after uh, the discovery that, that the Earth went around the sun. So you, the Earth's going around the sun and you have seasons, and the seasons determine uh, the length of the year. So various calendars try to have the, the year length of the calendar match the real, true year length. I've already told you that it changes, but not only does it change, it changes depending on where you measure from. Are you measuring from spring to spring, from winter to winter, from autumn to autumn? You name it, you get a different curve. So astronomers decided to make some kind of mean of all the various different kinds of uh, lengths of years. And each calendar tries somehow to hit something. So the Gregorian calendar is not a great approximation, as you can see, compared the French tried to do it really accurately. But really accurately to this line, but they really measure it from the autumn, so they're quite further away. The Persian measures from spring, so they thought they got it really close here. But, but it's uh, not necessarily close to the spring to spring calendar. But anyway, th that's uh, par for the course. You have no choice. Well, this is how, uh, well, I, I never got this rhyme right. And I always have to figure it out on my fingers how, uh, wh whether uh, March and April or May or how many days they have. But uh, 30 days have September and so on. This sounds very good. February, no, doesn't really fit the pattern nicely. And sometimes it's 28, sometimes it's 29. This is 16th century nursery rhyme in English, ostensibly based on a 13th century French one, which you can read. <laughs> and OK, okay the, 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 this is the leap year and so on. Um, OK, now, uh, president, our president, if you'll excuse me, uh, I, f I just found this yesterday. And he, yesterday for your... Uh, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, time for an important message about February. An important message about February. February is the shortest month with only 28 or 29 days. It's also the month with President's Day. So how well does this president know February? These are the actual results for the fiscal year that ended February the 30th. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, okay, you can't... Uh, it's a slip of the tongue. Okay, we won't, we won't fault him for that. I, I, 
in the year 2000, I was in New York, got in this taxi. This taxi driver spent the whole trip trying to convince me that February 2000 has 30 days. I mean, he, he, was, uh, he was talking to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, problems like this are not unique to the United States. The, the Executive Council of um, uh, Scotland was seriously embarrassed that they announced St. Andrew's Day, which is supposed to be the national, they wanted it to be the national day. You know, it was going to be on the 31st of November. Okay, well, didn't work out that way. Okay, so this is the rule. Every fourth year is a leap year, except every century year, except every fourth century. This is the rule for the Gregorian calendar. If the year is divisible by 400, uh, then it's an exception to the century rule, which is an exception to the every fourth year rule. I, uh, well, I was teaching at the University of Illinois, these uh, okay, students, uh, business students, 100 students in the class taking this course on uh, spreadsheets or something, and I asked them if they know the rule for the leap year. Well, one, most of them knew about uh, every fourth year is a leap year that they got right. One girl hesitatingly said that she thinks there's some rule for century years. So this is before 2000, so they hadn't lived through it, so they didn't really know. No one, no one knew anything about the 400-year rule. That's uh, unfortunate, but if you're going to program a calendar, you ought to know that. Okay, this is just uh, to tell you that, uh, that this is pretty... Uh, Okay, the, 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 this rule that I just explained to you in two lines uh, is explained like this on MS Support's uh, website. Okay, go to step two, go to step four, go to step five, this is, uh, figure it out. But it's the same rule. This is the correct rule. So, you think if everyone knows that, I mean, everyone should know that 96 is a leap year. Well, not only, uh, okay, so in New Zealand and in Australia, these plants, the smelters, close down midnight. Uh, New Year's Eve because uh, they thought years only have 365 days. Who ever heard of a 366 day year? The program never did. This was very complicated. They could track down the, program, the problem and lost a lot of money. Well, okay, that's just some smelting company in New Zealand. What about spreadsheets? So, uh, this is the, from some website here that uh, when uh, Excel was designed, well, they just copied the mistakes of their predecessors, Lotus and VisiCalc. And, and they Actually, they had no choice because they wanted it to be compatible with the mistakes of others, and, and that's what happened. <laughs> so, if you want, the big problem is that February 29th, 1900 is, is, is a day on the calendar. It's counted as a day, uh, and this leads to uh, mistakes in, in calculating. Uh, well, I, I wrote to Lotus uh, 92, as you can see. Thank you for your letter. We know all about this. The decision was made at some point that a change now would disrupt disrupt formulas which were written to accommodate this anomaly. If you have any more further questions, let us know. Okay. Well, where did this, this leap rule complication of, of the 100th year came about? Because, because we, there used to be a calendar called the old style calendar, the Julian calendar. And on the Julian calendar, today is June 1st. Or if you'd write it out, uh, it's the calends of June, the, the, the first of, of June. Very good. Uh, this uh, calendar was uh, instituted by Julius Caesar. Plutarch, in his biography of Caesar, praises Caesar for being such a genius and making the best, uh, more accurate than any other calendar you can imagine. And uh, so, so Julius Caesar uh, uh, led the committee that uh, prepared this calendar. And so there are various complications. In fact, there was a February 30th, way back in 46, before the Common Era, but uh, then things changed with the Julian calendar, and uh, you have Latin names and Greek names. The Julian calendar, you have similar calendars that have the same leap year rule. The Coptic calendar, the Ethiopic calendar still have that rule. And so, okay, in, in 46, there was a little change here, a little minor problem that uh, we have 225ths of February that year. But that's just to, to uh, restore the calendar to the way they wanted it. So what's, what's peculiar about the Julian calendar? Well, there's no year zero on the year uh, on the calendar makes it a little hard to calculate what every fourth year is if you have uh, negative years, but do it. The months we all know, a, a four-year cycle has 1461 days and it started whenever it started. Pope Gregory came along and said, yes, sorry, 
you even start in January? I'll, I'll mention that, no. Yes, it did, but not necessarily. So uh, Gregory came along and said this calendar, 365 and a quarter days is the average year. It doesn't match reality, and uh, Easter is not going to be in the spring and, and all kinds of problems like that. We have to revise the calendar, so he got some smart people together, like Lewis and others, and they designed a new calendar. And the new calendar, from the point of view of the, the solar year, it's just had one change, which is that years that are multiples of 400 should be uh, years that are not, sorry, century years that are not multiples of 400 sh should not be a leap year, and that makes a little change. So that now y you have the cycle is 146,000 or something days, and your year now, your year length is 365.2425. Instead, which is closer to what it really is. And, uh, but the Gregorian reform also included major changes to Easter. But besides that, uh, when the Pope announced it, uh, he wanted to bring, the rule, bring uh, spring back to March 21st, approximately. And in order to do that in October, they simply went from the 4th of October to the 15th of October. I once had a calendar I got in the mail from someplace that also had some mistake like that, but, but this was official. This was, wasn't, wasn't a mistake. This was to bring things back into sync with the way it used to be in the times of the Council of Nicaea. Well, that, that, that's good for the Catholic countries, but uh, God forfend that any Protestant country would follow the Pope. They, they only switched over like England, for example, in 1752. By the time 1752 rolled along, they needed to make a correction of an extra day from 2 to 14. Now, it's, uh, so that, that, that's what happened in England. And uh, it's... Uh, popular to say that there were riots in England on this occasion because people thought they were going to die 11 days earlier or, or something like that because the, the date of death was fixed in heaven or hell. And uh, well, that's probably a myth, but it's based on, on partly on this painting which says, give, give us back our 11 days. You know, this is a, uh, from, from a protest, uh, as you can see, a riot. All right, but that, uh, led to interesting things. For example, Kepler in his book, he finished it well either on the 17th or the 27th, you choose. And uh, he reread it uh, and, and, and while the type was set and all this he did in Austria and, and uh, he has two dates for everything. Okay, so as I said, Catholic countries followed the Pope immediately. Protestant countries, each one uh, decided in its own uh, good time. Britain we mentioned. Some places changed only in the 20th century to, to this calendar. That leads to interesting situations like Thomas Jefferson's grave where he was born in the old style and, and died in the new style. And that's what it's OS is short for old style because of the change in the British colony of uh, Virginia. Okay. A very interesting case to answer one of the questions I posed happened in Scandinavia. So this is an old Scandinavian uh, calendar but when they moved over to the Christian calendar uh, they had the Julian calendar like everybody else, but then uh, they wanted to switch to the Gregorian in 1699. But they didn't want these kind of riots that they had in England. They wanted to do it gradually. So to, do, to, make the, the, to adapt gradually, they decided that in 1712 we'll have 30 days. In February would have 30 days in 1712. And they do this every now and then so that until, until they caught up with the rest of the world. Okay, that didn't last very long. So they switched back again and they finally switched to the Gregorian. Which is why you have this, sorry, the peculiar uh, s calendar from 1712, sorry, where uh, you can see there is a February 30th in 1712 in Sweden. So, so much for uh, the history of the calendar. Now a little bit about uh, calculating these things. So to calculate it, we need to, to count. I did say, well, as someone asked, when does the year start? Sorry. The year starts uh, nowadays in January 1st, but uh, in many places and times it started on various different dates, including March 1st, March 25th, Easter, Christmas, September 1st. There are many different starting dates, just like we have fiscal years, and it depends where you are. Not only does it depend where you are, so I, I saw a letter dated the 1st of February 1659 or 1660, depending on whether you know, maybe the person who wrote it lived in one place and the person who got it in the other, but that's, there was this ambiguity. I think it's the question, well, was there a year zero is foolish? I mean, this is a year zero album of some uh, group. 
but um, so there was a year zero. You can say no because no one ever dated their letters year zero. That's that's true. The person who invented the the count of years that that is in use, uh, uh, bead, uh, didn't uh, use zero. Julian calendar doesn't have a zero. The Persian calendar doesn't have zero. But when it comes to the Gregorian calendar, the one that we all use. When astronomers use it, they do have a, a year zero. The ISO, one of the ISO, at least conventions, has a year zero. And the Hindu calendars, they knew about zero, as we all know, so they, have a ver they, have, they start their years with zero. So whether there's a year zero or not depends whom you ask, and that leads to ridiculous questions like whether, uh, when, when the millennium was. So to convert dates, I'm going to use a, a, a simple date count as the... the to sit in the middle, and there are various date counts out there. But there's a very ancient, not ancient, uh, old count of Julian days. This is the one astronomers use. It goes from noon to noon, and today is already 2,454,266 days since the epoch, since the date they decided to start this calendar from. Uh, you know, astronomers, this is convenient, noon to noon, because they work at night, they don't want the date to switch it while in the middle of work. <laughs> but for other people might like a midnight to midnight day count. So there's a modified Julian day, but we're going to use something else, which I'll call the fixed date. And uh, the Mayans actually also ha had something called the long count. They counted days uh, in this uh, fashion. They also had a zero. Okay, so, so with each calendar you have basically an epoch. Where does the counting start from? And, and so the Julian day starts from this date uh, uh, 6,700 and something years ago. And that's just done because that's, that precedes all historical dates. So they chose a date like that for various reasons. I won't go into the calendar. Chose that. Uh, okay, the modified date begins in 1858. That uh, gives you smaller numbers so it might fit in your computer more easily. But the, the count we're going to use is going to start on January 1st of the year one on the, what's called the proleptic uh, Gregorian calendar. It means imagine that the Gregorian calendar existed uh, 2,000 years ago. The Mayan calendar begins its count on the 11th of August in the year minus, I'm using the astronomical minus for, for the year count in which there was a year zero. So, and they write their day, they write in this uh, mixed radix, you know, so, so the, this base 20, but the, in this position for some reason it's base 18, and if you need more, you can extend it to the left uh, if you want, you need to count uh, bigger dates than, than that. But once you get that, uh, now you know how to decode a Mayan uh, document. The most interesting such count, it, it, there are various calendars, okay, Maya had two other calendars, one which had 19 and 20, and that gave uh, 19 months of 20 days, sort of. And another in which they, you have two cycles running in parallel. You count 13 and you count on a different count 20, and every day gets a pair of, of names. And as we'll see, the Chinese still do that. And, and, but the, the, uh, on Bali, this Paul calendar takes the cake, because they have 10 cycles running in parallel. And they have a 210 day year, they have a cycle of one day, that's not really one day, it's two days, every alternate day has a name, the other day doesn't get a name. A cycle of two, a cycle of three, okay, those all divide two tenths. But the, um, when it comes to eight and nine, they don't divide two tenths, so they have to double things up and, and do all kinds of funny things, and same thing for four. And ten has its own complicated rules for mysterious reasons. So they have the, every day then has this law, this is how the day is named. And uh, each temple has its anniversary on one of these 210 days. And so you get the pretty calendars like that. Okay, now the Chinese uh, use this today for, for naming years. So, you know, we say it's the year of the dragon or something. And, uh, but they have another, they have a cycle of ten going on in parallel with a cycle of twelve which gives you uh, 60, because a common divisor gives you 60 pairs of names. And they, today they're still used for years, and people don't necessarily know when they're born with a number. They know when they're born on, uh, on this uh, Chinese year name, which also starts, and you're born age one, by the way, in China, so that, that confuses the census takers. And uh, they used to use this also for months and, and years. Here are the totems. 
So we're going to use some day count to interconvert between different calendars. You take a country, like an, this is a calendar I picked up in India, they, they need, you know, they have six calendars that, that they need, and they have a list of holidays, you can have, they have uh, Hindu holidays, and Muslim holidays, and Christian holidays, and national holidays, and each one is on a different calendar. And uh, North India, South India, every city basically has, has to have its own dates. So, and uh, so you often have calendars with uh, mul multiple dates. We want to convert, okay, this has Hebrew and Arabic and, and Turkish and French and English. And so nowadays you may have computers to do this for you. What we want then, instead of having programs to convert between every pair of calendars, we're just going to have some central day count in the middle. And for each calendar, you need two programs to convert from a day count to the calendar, from the calendar to the day count. And that way, for you know, n calendars, you need two, to the n, two times n programs instead of n, n squared. And uh, that's what we do. Sometimes one direction is easier, sometimes the other. And that depends on the calendar. So for the Julian and Gregorian we're talking about, we have this fixed date, date number one over here. On the Gregorian calendar, that's January 1st, the year one. But on the Julian calendar, it was January 3rd. And if we can convert dates from Gregorian to this day count and from the day count to the Julian or, and vice versa were set. Just to give you a feel of, of how this works, which you don't, uh, the simplest calendar, like imagine some kind of calendar which had 360 days. Presumably there was a calendar like this in Mesopotamia. Maybe uh, Noah used it. And uh, say every month has 30 days, the 12 months of the year, and that's it. Okay, so it's a gross approximation to the length of the year, only 360 days. And if we use zeros, it's real easy to turn a date, say month, day, year, into a uh, count of days. When do the calendar start? Every year has 360 days, every month has 30. How many days in this month? Just add them up and you're done. Would it be that life were so simple? Uh, do it the other way around, you need floors and, and uh, remainders and so on, but still simple arithmetic and you can convert from the day count, date, into a month, day, year on this uh, non-existent calendar. So as I was saying, the problem is always going to be program it one way and the, the way the, the, the calendar is usually described and, and often you have to invert and often there, there is no algorithm given in the textbooks for doing, going the other direction, for example, Tibet or something. So sometimes it's easy to go in the other direction, it's just doing arithmetic, like in this simple example. Sometimes you have to worry about different cases because the rules are not so simple. Often, you, we can approximate it and just check uh, within a range of a year or two or a day or two whether it's right or wrong. Sometimes the, the, the approximation can be way off and uh, we use a binary search. Okay. The, I'm not going to show you modular arithmetic, uh, but uh, because of the complicated rule of the Gregorian calendar, you have to worry about 400, and you have to worry, you know, so you have to divide by the number of days in 400 years, the number of days in 100 years, the number of days in 4 years, the number of days in 1 year, and do all of that, and then figure out whether you need to add 1 or not. So the book is full of uh, functions like this. This one you can actually fool yourself and do it uh, more simply to calculate the year by f taking this fraction, multiplying it by the, the number of days that elapsed, but you need this two because it may be wrong, so you may be off by one, and you check whether you're off by one or not, but that's close to telling you how many years have elapsed with a given number of days. Sneak preview of the book. We have uh, some more formulas. And, and one thing I just want to mention briefly, because th there are these algorithms, Zeller's congruence or something that, that people, you know, these smart people can figure out what day of the week from any date and they do all this modular arithmetic in their heads. A and part of what they do, because the, the months are not uh, so r rationally distributed over the year, that if you start from March and end in fe with February, things work out a little better. So February is the variable month. So you pretend the year begins in March. And then here you have sort of the months here. And, and you can fit, you want, you want to fit a line that, that crosses each one of the vertical lines. And you don't have to use a, you know, a, a, uh, 
an approximation that tells you how many leap months you have out of 12, you can find some, uh, you can do some fraction, some different fraction that still gives you the right slope to cross all the lines and that way you get simpler algorithms. Well, that's just a taste uh, of these complicated uh, calculations that you use for calendars with these complicated arithmetic rules. You might say, well, why don't uh, we just do things right? You want a solar year? Let the year start when the sun, when spring really begins. Well, that's what they do in Iran. That's what the French try to do. They, want, they use astronomical uh, uh, calculations, not observations, to determine the start of the year. But uh, to each their own. The French wanted it to start in autumn because that's when the revolution began. And Paris, obviously, is the critical location. And uh, in fact, uh, you want to know when, uh, when the fall begins. But the fall might begin uh, one hour a day one year, another hour a day another year. You have to decide what is the critical time of day. Critical time of day, well, midnight. But which kind of midnight? Well, this is uh, apparent midnight. This is so sundial midnight, when, when the sun is actually straight below you. Okay. Well, in Tehran, they go by the spring, and they have uh, Noruz as the new year. But the, what, when does the spring begin? If it happens before noon in Tehran, then it's spring. If it's afternoon, then tomorrow's the beginning of the year. The Baha'i have the same idea. They also want to start with the spring equinox, but they haven't decided yet uh, which location to choose. Uh, Haifa, Acre, or Tehran remains to be seen. Okay, I was saying about apparent time, the, the d length of the day is not always 24 hours. Sometimes it's a little more, sometimes a little less, and, and the error, the difference rather than the error, accumulates in what's called the equation of time. And you can see these curves sometimes on sundials, which is how to correct from sundial time to local, to what is local clock time. And uh, that, that makes for the difference uh, between uh, apparent time, which they want to use in, uh, what they use in the Persian calendar, and clock time. But uh, actually this equation of time changes with time. So here's 10,000 years or something of the equation of time by Danny Hillis, who tried to build a clock that will last, you know, 10,000 years. So he, he needed to build this uh, device. Now just one word about the French, I can't resist. Uh, they want everything to be metric. They did actually change the watches also to have 100 minutes and so on. That didn't go over very well. But the change of the, the year, they decided they want 12 months, every month 30 days, every, every the 30 days divided into three decades, three 10 day periods. The only problem was they only gave people one day off out of 10. <laughs> that didn't go over very well. And one, people, one out of seven is better. This was a, a failure. Some, uh, okay, these are the official names and, and, and these are uh, the uh, British variant of the French names. <laughs> okay, but this, this was a, the calendar actually comes in two versions. There's an astronomical version and there's also an arithmetic version. But anyway, it was thrown out and uh, some people really had nasty things to say about the calendar that this is... <laughs> vulgar, you know, incongruous composition of profound learning and superficial frivolity, never mind. But uh, in fact, uh, this, the guy who quoted Adams added, not only is it so disastrous, but it's a permanent injury of, um, to science, I'm not sure why. Okay, that, that's the, all I want to say about the solar calendars. They are calendars that, that take the month as the basic unit. They want it to match the moon. Okay, so this is from Jules Verne, Jules Verne's book. Okay, so there's the sun on top and the moon goes around the earth and that gives us phases and the, so we can count months from new moon to new moon, for example. And uh, so the, uh, this is your standard picture of, uh, of how the phases change with the month. It's a little more complicated because the moon goes around the earth, but in the time that the moon has gone around the earth, the earth has gone around the sun and so from new moon to new moon is more than one revolution of, of the moon around the earth. So you get a month, so it takes 27 and a third days for the moon to go around the earth and 29 and a half days approximately to catch up to the sun again. And so calendars that have lunar months, the months that attempt to start the same phase every month, uh, include the Hebrew calendar, some of the Hindu calendars, the Easter calendar, the uh, Muslim arithmetic calendar, and so on. And each, this, this is the line of the month, which as I said, is changing in length. And each calendar 
tries to match. So let me just a few words about the Islamic calendar. So today uh, is the 28th of uh, Jumada, and there are different ways of calculating it. And, uh, but if you're going by observational, this is an, an attempt that means that the month starts when the crescent moon is first visible, and uh, or when someone thinks the crescent moon ought to be visible, or when some rule of thumb tells you that enough time passed since the astronomical new moon for it to be visible, and each country and each authority have their own rules. And uh, so uh, often uh, Ramadan ends before uh, it was physically possible to see the moon because uh, someone thought they saw it and everyone wants Ramadan to end so they can <laughs> start feasting. Or, as you know, the Gulf War, uh, during the, one of the, the Gulf War, they, they adjusted the calendar to, to minimize, uh, to lengthen uh, Ramadan. So. But that aside, uh, the, but, what makes the, the Muslim calendar different is that there is no leap month. Their months begin at, with each new moon, and they're 12 months a year, and that's it. So that's uh, on the average 354 days a year, sometimes one day less, sometimes one day more, and, and therefore Ramadan uh, migrates through the seasons. And here's a, a uh, Persian manuscript uh, in which uh, uh, it's explained that, that uh, like Muhammad says in the Quran that the number of months uh, is 12 and anything else is unbelief. So it, it, you may not add a, like the Arabs had done beforehand, you don't add an extra month uh, to, to every now and then to compensate for the length of the year. Instead you just have this 12-month uh, year. So that makes, uh, so you observe the new moon, but there's also some, some Muslim sects actually do arithmetic calculations instead, instead of observations, and, and many people use it as an approximation at least. And in that case, since the length of them, you can alternate 29-day months, 30-day months, that's easy, but, but you still want the year sometimes to have 354 days and sometimes more. And so 11 out of 30 years is a good approximation to, uh, to add an extra date to the year to get, to get the uh, things in tune with the, with the moon. So if you have, there's an arithmetic rule for the Islamic calendar, and then you want to distribute these 11 leap years evenly among the 30. And so there are these cute formulas in which you can take the year number, multiply by 11, shift it, take it mod 30, and if you get less than 11, it's a, it's a leap year, and if not, not. And that gives you some cycle of, of evenly distributed leap years in this 30-year cycle. And there are different variations on this rule. But actually, what are the most fa uh, interesting calendars are the lunar solar ones. Those that attempt to, to keep in tune with both with the moon and with the sun, so the months match the moon, and the years average out to, to, to match the years. And in fact, nature has several calendars like this. So there's several species of coral that spawn on the same night, you know, all of them, and which night? Full moon, first full moon of spring which is exactly this lunar solar calendar. And there are also some bugs in New Guinea that behave like this and so on. So it's quite natural. And um, what that leads to is a calendar in which you have 12 or 13 months a year. And uh, depending, so what you, since you want each year to have either 12 or 13, not 12 and a third months, you want to spread out these leap years in some fashion, and depending on exactly what, your, what average year length you want, you can determine how, how this works. So the most famous approximation is this 19-year cycle called the Metonic Cycle. It's uh, not just due to, uh, it was known in Mesopotamia before Greek, Metan, and it's used in the Hebrew calendar today in the Easter calendar. But even more interesting is, one of this, is a Hindu calendar, which has a 180,000-year cycle to approximate the length of uh, which. But so, so we've designed a generic calendar. If you want to do it, and you want to do it right, and you, you, you want a, a, uh, to match both a year length Y and a month length M, with some offsets, delta doesn't matter, then here's the way to do it. Let me skip that. Here's the way to do it. 
you take uh, the, the month number, multiply by the month length, make a correction if you want, take the ceiling, number of days, and um, you calculate the number of elapsed months by taking the, the average number of months per year, that's the length of the year divided by the length of the month, that's the average number of months a year, multiply by the number of years, make some corrections if you want, how many months there were this year, and then you know how many days should elapse on a, on a beautiful mathematical lunar solar calendar that no, that no one except the Hindus uh, had uh, and no longer use. And, and the other direction is more complicated, I'm going to skip that, but that's just to invert the functions. So then you just have to choose your constants and, and you have a calendar. So if you want a 19 year cycle like, like, the, uh, like this one, if, uh, it works out pretty nicely. Uh, so that the error is like one day in every 200 and something years. And, and that's what is at the basis of the Hebrew calendar and at the basis of the Easter calendar. But one day every 200 years adds up. Which is why Passover is often late and Easter also uh, has a, uh, uh, the Orthodox Easter has an accumulative error. All right, um, this is an old ca uh, calendar archaeologists found in Gezer, a Hebrew calendar. And uh, the calendar that's uh, used today on the Hebrew calendar, my mom said oh, even school children should get it right in three or four days. Principles are easy. Every month has either 29 or 30 days because the lunar month is uh, something in between. Years have 12 or 13 months. Let's distribute 17 leap years out of 19, so it works pretty well. Just to make it complicated, let's add a rule that, that the year never begins on Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday for unknown reasons. I mean, the, the suggested reasons, but let's, because of that rule that Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday can't begin a new year, that means that um, you're not, if you do things naturally, you may fall out of the natural range of days per year, because normally uh, 12 months should add up to something this range, 13 months to that range. You want to keep it within that range, so add some more exceptions and more rules. Decide when you start counting. Bear in mind that days begin at sunset, that doesn't matter much, and there's your calendar. But Tel Aviv University couldn't get that right. And uh, okay, here's Passover. Uh, it starts one day early. All right. Um, it's a, you said no Wednesday Passover? That was a Wednesday Passover. Okay. So, um, all right, this guy Scalinger who, who invented uh, the, the, uh, this count of years that astronomers now use to, to date uh, astronomical events, had nice things to say about the Hebrew calendar, but that's also exaggerated. So it gives you an average uh, length of a year, like it says here, which as I said is wrong, which is why Passover is now uh, every few years one month too late. In other words, Easter is the same story. The 19 year cycle is used, but the original rule was that Easter should be the first Sunday after the first full moon on or after the vernal equinox, very, very precise. Only problem is, When's the full moon and when's the equinox? Well, not only that, they, uh, okay, so, so you could uh, sort of, it's the same rule as Passover except for the Sunday part, first full moon a after spring, but that, that was no good because they, they, uh, the emperor wrote to the council of Nicaea that uh, we should do things differently. So they did things differently. So th this is a, a uh, hand method of calculating when Easter is. So you can figure this out. It comes with a few pages of instructions, not just. <laughs> People build the clocks, fancy clocks. Gauss wrote articles about calculating Easter. Oh, oh I'm running out of time, sorry. Uh, so let me talk instead in the last few minutes about the most fascinating set of cal uh, calendars I've worked on. Those are the Hindu calendars. And the Hindu calendars come in many varieties. I already mentioned that there are, old Hindu, there are old calendars. These are beautiful arithmetic calendars that, that just the formulas just work the way you expect them to. And uh, just the only thing is they have a 180,000 year cycle, but for computers that's no problem. But then they decided that's not good enough. Because that's just an average calendar with mean values, but, but uh, okay, so this is an old calendar. 
but we want now a calendar that, that is more accurate. So, like it says in the quote, the Hindu calendars are by far the nearest approaches to the actual machinery or astronomical phenomena go governing our planet. The only problem is that my friends don't know how it works. <laughs> and in fact, I was in India, you know, room full of people, no one. They have no inkling. Yes, my grandma told me this is the right day to go to the temple for this and that purpose, but that's it. They, how do they know? They, they have the, the temple prints a calendar. I right, so I've... I've uh, so, to do the calculation, they do have a day count called Aragana, but they st that they start, started some uh, two million year, days ago. And um, they use that day count for the same purposes that, that I described earlier to, to make calculations e easy. You know how many days elapsed, and from that you try to determine the date. But the, the idea here was to, to approximate the true beginning of the month and the true, the, the true solar and lunar events. So in the old version, they just had these cyclical formulas that I mentioned that I'm not going to work out for you. That, um, I'm skipping, nice cup. The old rule says you have a 180,000 year cycle. This is how many, you have 2 million something months in 180,000 years do the arithmetic just with ceilings and floors and everything works out. And, and uh, when, but then every month has the same length, every year has the same length. Uh, but let me first explain to you some, some interesting peculiarity. When are you going to have the leap month? When are you going to have 13 months instead of 12? So if, you, if you're doing, using this average calendar, you have, uh, you divide the year into 12 parts. These are the solar months. And then you have lunar months which follow from new moon to new moon. Now sometimes in a solar month, and that is while the sun is in the same sign of the zodiac, uh, they're using a different version of the signs of the zodiac, but that doesn't matter. Sometimes you have two, since the lunar month is shorter than the solar month, it's 29 and a half days rather than 30 and a half days, sometimes you'll have two new moons in the same solar month. That is your indication that this should be a leap month. So any month of the year can be a leap month, because the, 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 you, know, you just align these two lines and, and you'll have this repeated cycle of leap months uh, um, migrating through the year. That was the basic pattern. That explained the leap months and that's how things used to work before, uh, sorry, bef before, okay, so I said the formulas are easy, the arithmetic is easy, just do that. But then, they said, let's try to match the true time of the new moon and the true time when the sun enters some constellation. Let's see what constellation the moon is in. And at the time, they used the uh, astronomy of those days, Talmaic astronomy, in which has cycles and epicycles and fudge factors and so on to, 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 to do this. So the moon is not going around the earth at an even pace. It's going around, it's getting pulled by cords of air uh, from this epicycle so that it gets more an elliptical motion. This gives you an, a more of an, uh, moves the earth from the center. And so you have this classic work, Surya Siddhanta, which explains in verse how to do all your calculations. You have a sign table here written out in uh, detail. You have observatories. You have your constants, how long the average year is the month, uh, how, how, uh, and how things turn on the epicycle. You do this all. We did it with uh, uh, infinite precision and rational calculations, straight by the book, no logarithms, no approximations, nothing. You get 400 digits divided by 400 digits or something like that, but then you get your calendar. So, but when you do things with this, uh, astronomical calendar using this medieval astronomy to approximate the times of the new moon, you get additional peculiarities. Uh, with, since uh, time, um, you have, not only do you have leap months, like we said, you also have leap days, and you also have skip days. Well, so you can have two days in a row. The days are determined by the phase of the moon at sunrise. If two days in a row, the phase of the moon is the same, you have a leap day. If, you divide the phases into 30. If uh, 
and one day you sort of skip a phase, then you double up your day. You know, it's both the 30th and the first phase of the moon on the same day. And this gives you a, a beautiful uh, calendrical arrangement. So the idea then, if you want to do it, you, you calculate the time of the new moon. You see where the sun is at that time. If it's the same as the next month, that means you have two new moons in the same month, then the first of those two is the leap month. Okay, you check what phase is the moon at at sunrise. That tells you the day number, called Tithi. If it's the same as the previous day, then as we said, it's a leap day. So you can have leap days, leap months, but you can also have skip months and skip days. If you have two new moons, uh, uh, sorry, if you, ha you can have a, a uh, two new moons that, not what it says here, that, that skip a whole sign of the zodiac. So you have, the whole month is missed. But then later on the year is going to catch up and you're going to have an extra leap month. So you really have an ordinary year. You have an ordinary leap year. You have a peculiar ordinary year in which you both skip a month and double a month. And you have a peculiar leap year in which you skip one month and add two months. All those can happen. And um, Okay, so, but that's only a medieval approximation to the motion of the moon and, and there's actually a, a significant error in it. So people have suggested let's use astronomy rather than modern astronomy instead of medieval astronomy and calculate an astrono astronomical calendar instead. So some, are, some calendars in India are follow the books, like the, the one we programmed. I think we were the first to program in our, in our book. Other people take their astronomical data from almanacs or from uh, modern astronomical programs and try to do things different. And this is a hundred year old uh, descript com description comparing them. So if you did an astron astronomical uh, month for the same month of December two years ago that I was illustrating, you have two day, you have two twenties and two twelves here. It looks and a doubled up five six over here and a doubled up twenty nine thirty. This is using modern astronomical programs to do the same calculations that uh, have been done using approximations to the Ptolemaic theory. Uh, we, we completely ignore minor differences, like different names for the months or different starting points for the year or different starting points for the year count. And in India, sometimes, some counts start from zero, some counts start from one, so they have many versions of, of, of every calendar. Yes? Did the Indians actually do hand computation with 400 digits? No, speed? no. They, they approximate. And uh, they have books. Uh, so the, this fellow, uh, people published uh, articles with log tables. And, uh, or they do re repetitive calculations. But no one uh, does binary search, like uh, I don't think, which is what computers would do. Unf okay, this is the same author who wrote extensively about the Indian calendars. Unfortunately, he, he thought these were simple. He wrote five, a series of five articles on the subject. Finally, so, so the, the calendar in Tibet is similar, and we find, uh, but a little simpler, which we finally succeeded in programming. But as I said, the calendar in Nepal, which is like the solar calendar in India, no one wants to divulge the secrets of. Chinese calendar, though, is in fact an astronomical version of the same ideas as the Hindu calendar. Let's use the, the precise position, positions of the sun and the moon to determine when, the, when, the new, um, when every month begins and when every year begins. And the, the correct rules are that every year has 12 or 13 months, every month has 29 or 30 days, months begin on the day of the new moon, and to determine whether you have a leap year or not, you need to see how many months there are between winter solstice and winter solstice. And the, the rule is, which was, is that the winter solstice must be always in the 11th month of the year. And so if you have a year that has 13 new moons in this period of solstice to solstice, then it's a leap year. Which month is going to be a leap year? Same idea as the Hindu calendar. If you have two new moons in the same solar month, 
And the first such one is going to be the leap year. They don't skip months like the Hindus. So you have a Chinese calendar. Finally, the Chinese felt that uh, copyrights uh, are very important. So falsification of the calendar is punished by death. We wouldn't have many bugs in our software with this implemented elsewhere. If you violate the copyright, you get 100 blows in two months of, uh, uh, in, in the stock. And uh, so this is a pretty uh, New Year's present. Uh, and there was a big uh, production when they delivered the official copies to the emperor and the empress. I understand that in Finland until the mid-90s there was also a monopoly, only the government could publish a Finnish calendar and no one else was allowed to. So finally, we, we, after we published this book, uh, we also made a book of uh, tables to replace uh, okay, the book of tables beforehand was this book by Schramm. And instead, uh, we published, uh, I mean, not instead, uh, we, we have a book of tables of 300 years of, of dates. It looks all produced by computer, no typos in it. And uh, so this is uh, this month on various calendars. And holidays, I just want to say that the Hindu calendar took forever to calculate. Sorry. I can't. Yes, I'm concluding with Mars, if I can get this to. Hmm. It's in a loop. Okay. So, last question is, as I was, uh, oh, sorry, calendar for Mars. Don't know how to do this. The, uh, so there was a, a few years ago, a, the founding conference in 1998 for the Society of Mar Mars Society. They want to, they're planning on settling on Mars. This was a serious conference actually. People from, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So the time has come to settle Mars. They said we can do it in 10 years. That gives them one year to do it in. <laughs> and the government of Mars, as you can see here, uh, asked us to design a calendar for Mars. Paid us $1,250. The government of Mars, in case you're wondering, is located in Albuquerque. <laughs> And our proposal was, it was to do the same thing as the idea of the Hindu calendar. I don't want to tell you much, too much about Mars, and let's occasionally skip a day. So go, for example, from the 16th to the 18th of August, so that your dates are kept in line with the dates on Earth. And the days are like the days on Mars, which are half an hour longer than the day on Earth. And all is well that ends well. Thank you very much. Is the story right that Julius Caesar fixed the calendar to stop the consul bribing the Pontifex Maximus to lengthen the year? The, um, the, 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 I don't think so. The, there was uh, criticism of the fact that the priests were in charge of the calendar. And there was also a lunar calendar. It's also a myth that July uh, is long uh, in honor of Ju Julius Caesar. But uh, that's all I know. Not true. I don't think so. Has it always been a seven-day week? No, there are five-day weeks, six-day weeks, seven-day weeks, eight-day weeks. Most, uh, many cultures had a market, a cycle of market days. And so in Africa, you have like, and in, in Rome also, you had uh, five-day cycles, and other places you have different length cycles. And uh, that, that's the best guess of where the, the, these the shorter cycles come from. Is some kind, it's, it's from a market uh, economy. Yeah. You talked about people not revolting in England, but I'm pretty sure I read in communications at ACM about people revolting in France. That they had a short month, the workers were getting less wages, but the 
uh, landlords were trying to collect the full rent, and so yeah. the peasants were revolting. But there were there were legal problems like that, but the, the laws have the laws usually specified, you know, what's supposed to happen. So, which, uh, but peop yeah, there were complaints. But uh, the article I recently read about England claimed that the, that the riot is exaggerated; that there were issues, but not riots. I know. I don't, I don't think that there there were uh, as serious uh, as is portrayed today. But I wasn't there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.